My name is Michael D'Agostillo, uh, staff writer at Forbes, um, dedicated exclusively to uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain. Um, I've been uh, watching for the past several years, looking for companies that my parents recognize actually getting into blockchain and cryptocurrency. Uh, and this panel really jumped out to me because, first of all, I love, the, I love when they get a group of true competitors all together on a stage. It's one of my favorite things about blockchain, how frequently that happens. Um, and then uh, secondly, uh, the infrastructure that these gentlemen have helped put together um, are in many ways laying the foundation for what it is that I've been looking for. Uh, companies that my parents recognize uh, actually mentioning Bitcoin in public and perhaps even getting into it professionally. Um, Custody, though, uh, I, 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 I kind of feel like in the early days, custody was almost a controversial thing because uh, we, we, were, we were promised a, a bill of sale that, that you know, we could hold this uh, technology, we could hold this investment without middlemen. So the fact that um, we, we've seen this developing ecosystem is, I think, really, really fascinating and a really interesting opportunity. Um, I, I do want to, because I'm a journalist at heart, I want to make sure that the first thing that we do is define terms. Um, so I, I want to make sure that it's very, very clear for everybody in the audience, in case there is anybody um, kind of at the beginning stages of, of crypto investment, to talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of custody. And I'd like to ask Dimitri here to my left, um, if you could uh, help us define the term, first of all. So when we're talking about custodying a crypto asset, yeah. um, we, we, you know, in, in shorthand, we talk about holding Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, but we're not actually holding Bitcoin. Can you talk a little bit about what are we holding and what are the, the technical um, difficulties of holding something so abstract? Sure. Well, um, in traditional space, a uh, custodian would serve an equation, for example, when a crypto fund, or sorry, like a hedge fund would set up a structure that would need an administrator, prime broker, custodian to segregate duties and responsibilities, basically, to make sure that there is no self-custody mode. And history has shown that this is a really bad idea when a, basically a fund or an asset manager can basically do whatever they want with assets. Um, but crypto added an extra layer, which became also of importance, which is a security element of it. Due to the nature of those assets, um, the transactions are immutable. So if Bitcoin transaction, Ethereum transaction takes place, you can't reverse it. So that's why, essentially, we started talking also about the security um, um, as a context of you know, custody in, in this space. So we're talking about private keys, though, largely. Um, and, and, but you, we, we were having a conversation earlier that private keys are almost uh, a, a, a distraction. Um, I, I want to open up uh, to a, a question to the whole panel here. Um, what are the biggest obstacles um, that you're uh, looking to overcome here? If it's not really a matter of securing private keys, what are the security vectors that you're most concerned about? I'll, I'll kick it off there. I think um, when, when we look at it, we are, uh, as a custodian, absolutely thinking about this in terms of custodying private keys, because mm -hmm. custodying private keys is the way that we hold the assets. However, we increasingly look at it as we are custodying software. Uh, and what I mean by that is that uh, a private key uh, is an ability to do something in a crypto network. So I, I, work at, I work at Anchorage, and at Anchorage what we focus on a lot is kind of active participation, being able to not only hold the assets but allow our clients to use the assets within some network. Uh, and so when we think about it, we think about it as a, a step beyond just holding the assets. The, the, we're really holding a set of software that needs to run and needs to be used to uh, facilitate institutional intent. I'll give you one quick idea. Um, this week, there's a um, major vote coming up out in the MakerDAO network, uh, and we're going to allow our clients to participate in that vote. Uh, it's almost like you would see proxy voting in, in traditional institutions, uh, where you have an opportunity to vote in a, in a shareholder meeting or something like that. Um, however, when there's no, there's no shareholder meeting, there's nothing like that, it's just kind of a, a vote within the network, um, we find that our institutional clients are wanting to participate in that in the same way. Um, which provides a lot of technical challenge from holding the keys to interacting with the smart contracts and having that all kind of in a, a pane of glass that they can trust. Uh, so that's, that's kind of where we're going and where we're thinking about how this should expand. Pete, Bitco has been around from uh, basically the, 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 the very beginning. Um, and I'm, I'm, 
you started off as a, as a hot wallet, um, non-custodial, and, and, and evolved. Uh, if a hot wallet is possible, um, if non-custodial is possible, what are the, what are the um, demands that you saw that sort of led to BitGo, and, and how are you evolving going forward? I, I think it builds on a little bit on what um, Nate was just talking about, and, and, and kind of to your original question. So we don't think that there's a lot of discussion in the market around is it a hot wallet, is it a cold wallet, is it online, is it offline, et cetera. And it's, this shouldn't be a, a debate about temperature, right? It should be a debate about security versus accessibility. So we believe at BitGo that the most secure um, position for your assets, truly most secure, is completely offline. There's a debate about that in the market right now. It probably doesn't make a lot of sense to go deep down that rabbit hole on this panel. But if the, if the continuum is hot wallet to completely offline, you're not supposed to have to worry about that. You hire a custodian to worry about that. You're supposed to tell us, this is the amount of your asset base you need immediate accessibility to. This is the amount of your asset base that you don't. And then we're supposed to have a, a full stack of security solutions that we deliver that provides you that in the safest way possible. That's where I think it's going. I, I, personally, I'm of the view that, that um, security's been solved. That's a controversial thing to say, right? Because there will be hacks. But um, the reality is those hacks are largely coming only on exchanges or in locations where folks that, um, that don't do security for a living are taking it on themselves and making a bunch of mistakes. I think it would be kind of interesting, really, really quick, um, uh, I'd like to start with Frank at the far end there and kind of just uh, come towards me. Um, in, in one sentence, if you can describe, well, first of all, say the company that you're with just to make sure that the audience knows, and then in, in one sentence, describe uh, your crypto custody solution. Uh, so Frank Fahrenbach, I'm at Bank of New York Mellon. Our, our crypto custody solution, we don't have a public offering to custody cryptocurrencies. Next. Jay Biancomano, State Street. Our uh, non-existent custody solution is theoretical. <laughs> Next. <laughs> uh, I'm Pete Nigerian at BitGo. We are a, the largest uh, hot wallet provider and also a South Dakota chartered regulated trust company. Nathan? Uh, Nathan McCauley. We hold all of our assets in hardware security modules and only allow them to be accessed in the presence of our clients' biometric authentication. And Dimitri. Um, Dimitri, um, CEO of Copper. Um, our custody solution works in such a manner that two out of three elements uh, are kept outside of our infrastructure to further enhance the security, um, but also added on top, which is also, we believe, is an important layer is we segregate the responsibilities of a custodian and uh, a client, which is very important for investors when we're talking about institutional asset managers. And so uh, this is the, the, the concept of, of sharding that we were talking about earlier. Can you just kind of, uh, I, I, I like the sharding concept because it's kind of a, a halfway point between centralized and decentralized. Can you um, talk about that strategic decision, um, what it was specifically about the customers that you're serving that you thought made that particularly viable. Yeah, so, well, our balance sheet is slightly lower than of Bank of New York Mellon or State Street, so <laughs> when clients basically came to us and said, well, this is great, but we don't want to trust you guys. So um, what we've done essentially is we've done two things. One, we, we, don't, we decided not to store private keys. We use sharding and we use uh, multi six in reality, it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll, I'll come down to that. But it's Can you um, just really quick uh, sharding and multi-sig. I just want to yeah. make sure that everybody get, is on the same page there. So, uh, just uh, what is sharding and what is multi-sig? Sure. Multi-sig basically uh, is used uh, traditionally in uh, Bitcoin forks, so Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin, and etc. So this is basically where you create a multi-sig on a, on, a, on a blockchain layer, essentially. Whereas you know, three participants and you can create n of m, say two out of three. So three participants will have private keys, their own private keys, dedicated private keys which then you need two, for example, out of three signatures for the transaction to be valid. And sharding? And sharding, where you basically use typical uh, polynomial sharding methodology that is used quite widely in the sector, Shamir secret sharing. Shamir secret sharing is essentially where you take and also can break the key into N of M, but then N of M uh, would make up the whole key again, essentially. So um, that's, that's, that's a natural the differences between them. There's another methodology which is, which is gaining popularity in PC, which is typically like Shamir secret roughly, but in, in such a way that you don't put the key together. But 
there is, there is actually one thing which is somewhat of an elephant in the room. You know, we talk a lot about private keys, but what we're actually seeing, the angles of attacks start from lack of 2FAs, SIM swapping, uh, public APIs, uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, maybe you get down to like a remote code execution. Maybe you get down to transaction substitution. So before, basically, we talk about private keys, all those things need to be sold. So, so, so in that sense, you know, when an exchange, for example, uses a custodian or doesn't use a custodian, they need to get that layer done first. Because if exchange believes that they got $40 million and it needs to be withdrawn to that address, whether it's hot, cold, warm, doesn't matter. It's an API called away from being withdrawn somewhere, right? Now, Nathan, you went with Software Guard extensions um, in, in your solution there, which is, um, well, for, I don't want to, I won't put the words in your mouth. What is a Software Guard extension, and why was that the solution that you guys went with? So, <clears throat> um, I guess maybe just a little, bit of a, a little bit of an update there. So, the, um, the way that we store the assets is in these dedicated devices called hardware security modules. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the hardware security modules because I think a lot of folks in crypto ought to be thinking about using these. Um, the first thing to say about them is that they're extremely mature, and dare I say, even boring technology. Um, and when you're talking about a business line as boring as custody, I think it's important to make boring technology decisions. Uh, and so we looked at what is the, what is the most secure, uh, most trusted, widely trusted set of technology that you can use for storing keys. Turns out that all of the NATO militaries, all of the, the large banks, and all of the large uh, technology companies when they have a key management problem that is very significant, they use hardware security modules. And so when we, when we came and looked into the cryptocurrency ecosystem, we were kind of shocked to find that they weren't that prevalent yet. Um, because this is just the, for, for most sectors, using hardware security modules is the obvious choice. And so uh, we decided, hey, let's, let's take what other people have already figured out, uh, already have as mature technology, and apply it to this space. And then we added a layer on top, because as Dimitri is saying, it's not just about how you store the keys, it's also about how you authenticate into the system. Uh, so at Anchorage, that's where we, we focus on this notion of biometric authentication to unlock the hardware security modules. And those, that two, those two pieces together, kind of combined, are what really um, provides the, the security of the software solution. We can't just think about custody, we can't just store, think about how we have to store the keys, we also have to think about how do you get access to those keys. Yeah. So, um, Frank, uh, earlier this year, um, BNY Mellon um, had saw some headlines related to your work with Bact, um, and we saw some developments yesterday with Bact as well. So, first of all, I, I, I'm hoping that you can just quickly catch us up on um, what was it that was um, announced earlier this year, what BNY Mellon was doing with Bact. And then uh, the news that was revealed yesterday, um, Bact's wholesale, uh, I'm sorry, uh, what are they calling it? Uh, back store? What, what, the, 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 the back custody product that was announced yesterday. Does that impact your work with them? Sure. Well, let me talk a little bit about that. But uh, I think it's funny you have BNY Mellon and State Street up here, and, and we obviously haven't gone public with a, a big cryptocurrency custodian platform. Um, but safe to say, we, we look at it pretty heavily. I think you want me to play a little bit of the counter up here, uh, obviously for a variety of reasons. I'll, I'll say that I'm a, a crypto enthusiast, right? We, we spend a lot of time in the digital asset space, but I'm gonna take a lot of the counterpart, counterpoints to the folks on the stage here, uh, make it a little fun, right? So a lot of the things that have been said about custody so far and what actually is custody and what is the definition of custody, and a lot of the things that we think about internally at BNY is what are we trying to solve? What, what is the problem in the market? And when you look at, let's say, Bitcoin, it's close to, to four years old, and you've seen a lot of volatility. And I'm sure several in the room a few years ago said, you know, it's going to a million or it's going to 100,000, and it's 8,000, right? Um, and it's, it's surely an asset class. But, but when, you know, we as the largest global custodian on planet Earth, we have 34 trillion of assets under custody, one out of every four dollars in assets is custody to BNY Mellon. You probably don't even know, but the brokerages and the banks all custody their assets with us. And what does that mean? I mean we, we control the ledger, right? We make sure this, the sanctity and safety of your assets are secure. So we have all sorts of clients coming into us from private wealth clients and institutional, like, hey, can you custody Bitcoin or whatever cryptocurrency it is? 
Uh, and, and our response says, well, where is it custody now? Probably with one of the folks on stage, and why do you need us, right? If, if it's already being custody, why do you need BNY? Uh, so you have some institutional responses, like BACT, um, where you have a major exchange, New York Stock Exchange, ICE, coming in and saying, and getting a license to trade in the futures market, and, and they need an institutional custodian, so we're operating as, as the, as the Basically, resilience, it's not even the first order, but uh, it, is, it is a step in the, in the market um, in, a, in a cold storage capacity. Um, you know, both State Street and, and BNY have invested in a, in a company called Finality, which is utility settlement coin. So this is the, the market, and there are 14 other banks in NASDAQ? There are 14 that, originally, yeah. That, that are invested, a consortium bid. And, and this is really to, to tokenize the dollar, tokenize the euro, tokenize the yen, uh, the Canadian dollar and the and GBP. And so, you know, we're investing in this space and, you know, looking again at, at where the cryptocurrencies are trading and the problems they're trying to solve versus what's in the market, right? Well, you're, you're all using dollars, right? You're all trading dollars. There, there, there are some settlement time inefficiencies. Surely there are in the market and we've made a lot of progress. But uh, you know what? What can we do as the custodian, and, and our position too, in BNY Mellon and, and the Treasury market and the repo market and, and, and downstream, so to speak, um, to make that more efficient? So, Frank, in the existing infrastructure. Just because the, the news guy in me just has to peg it to something that just happened yesterday. So, can you just update us on where BNY Mellon is with backed as of? Uh, yeah, no. I mean, I, I don't want to oversell that solution, right? I mean, it's it's we are we are a, a third order. Cold storage again, saying everything that's that's public out there in terms of what we're we're doing with Bact to to provide a, a backup custodian solution, and that's still ongoing. Um, oh, sure. Okay. Would would you describe the service as sort of white label? Uh, the, the BNY Mellon was noti noticeably absent from a lot of the articles that covered the backstory. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, we're not. It, the first order, this is not a launch of a product, right, for us. We're not going out to the market and saying, we now have a, a, uh, a custody solution. So what I've talked about in terms of, of investment in finality or what we're doing with BACT, or there, there are other use cases that we've, we've mentioned, in, in, certainly in blockchain, right? Um, but, you know, I, I, again, I, I don't think we, we're, I don't want to oversell this as like, this is BNY, Mellon's, you know entrance into the, the crypto custody market, right? And uh, Jay, I, I saw you um, sort of fidgeting when we were talking about the, the assets under management over there. Um, State Street's nothing to, to shake a stick at, doing pretty well. Um, can, can you just, why are you up here if you're not custodying? Um, <clears throat> well, yeah, why am I up here? No, uh, we, are, um, we are heavily invested in this technology. Right? We are, we're a DLT shop, we're a hyperledger shop. Um, we don't really focus on the crypto Bitcoin space. You know, two years ago, that's what everyone was thinking about. We're really interested in the digital asset space, right? Traditional assets that become digitized. And that's really what we're, we're thinking about. Now, that being said, we kind of have the same philosophy as BNY, and I think we're 33 trillion, so we're not that far. Very close. Depending on the market right, today, right we on. could, you know. <laughs> um, but, you know, and we, we talk to all our peers on the street, and we talk to a lot of uh, startups. And one of the things I think you have to understand is, um, you know, I think, I think Pete said, custody is boring. It is boring. It's boring because it should be not even thought of in the whole capital market infrastructure. Our clients really shouldn't care about custody because institutional clients have to hire a custodial bank to protect and safe keep their assets, and we work with DTC. And to them, it should be completely transparent. Now, you know, look at the other side of the coin. Look how manual and draconian uh, crypto assets are right now. So the technology really hasn't caught up to what institutions need. And institutions need a completely transparent, seamless way of investing in these. And you know, having to wait two days or giving me a gun to protect the assets is not really how it's going to work. So I think we, you know, what, one of the reasons we are very interested in the crypto market, and we're looking at a number of use cases, is you know, the way Bitcoin trades and the way Bitcoin is going to evolve is the same way any other asset is going to evolve, right? trading on a blockchain. So that to us is exciting. And we think you know, that is a market that's going to, you know, it right now is burgeoning. I think you, know, you have a lot of, um, I wouldn't say use cases, but a lot of like, nascent investments in real estate, tokenized real estate. And 
you know, our clients are heavily interested in Bitcoin, but they're also very interested in, you know, what does it mean for a bond to trade on the blockchain, a, an equity trade on the blockchain. And that to us is the exciting piece because when you do have 34 trillion in assets and those assets are, you know, safe kept in a, yeah, at DTC and you're servicing those assets, what happens when they're digitized? Well, you have to be prepared for that inevitability. So I'm, try I'm trying to avoid um, pitting the startups against the legacy companies here, um, but I'm gonna briefly kind of do that. Um, so we've, we've got two gentlemen at the end here who can relatively casually um, say the words trillion dollars um, without flinching. Um, and then uh, three other gentlemen here um, who are, have um, tried and true businesses, um, but not quite at that, at that scale. Um, I, I want to address um, what, what I will call the startup founders. Um, Bitgo has been around for quite a while, but I think still definitely qualifies as a startup. Um, when, when you see uh, the, the State Streets and the BNY Mellons of the world sort of sitting on the sidelines, um, what are you doing from a business perspective? Are, are you studying them? Are you um, trying to understand their customers? Do you see them as competition? Uh, or are you chomping at the bit for them to come out guns blazing? So I'll take it. I, I, um, I'm excited for them to arrive and arrive in a real way. I mean, I, I, and we feel the same way about Fidelity and Back. We know those teams well. We think they're um, excellent teams and smart people and doing good things. I think that um, we need to grow this pie. This industry needs to grow. I mean, we, we, it, in my opinion, the elephant in the room at these events, particularly this year, is that this, this is largely now just a native crypto audience having a conversation with itself. And that's not a criticism of I me. Mean, we're all doing a, a, a fantastic thing here, and it's an amazing revolution, and it's incredible to be part of it. But if this is going to happen in the way we all hope it's going to happen, this room needs to be filled with a lot of new faces, big crossover investors that are ready to come in and commit third-party capital in a meaningful way, and that's third-party capital that wasn't given to them for the sole reason of, of investing in cryptocurrencies. And I, I think the notion that a group of startups, and yes, we're, we're a little longer in the tooth than anybody else you would call a startup in this space, but I think the notion that a group of startups are going to lead this and completely revolutionize the financial services industry without the incumbents playing a part, and more importantly, without the huge pools of capital that we need to drive this, asking the incumbents to play a part is a foolish notion. So if it's going to happen, and if the revolution's going to happen in the way we hope, uh, we think we have a role, but we're probably going to have a role in an ecosystem that includes some big guys and figuring out how to do something with them together. And Nathan, sa same question to you. Yeah. In the interest of kind of giving the audience um, a, a peek in, into your boardroom, so to speak. Yeah. If, if you could share a little bit about the strategy and the thinking and the, the positioning that your company is doing um, as these trillion dollar organizations are sitting on the sidelines. Do you study their customer base? Are you going after their customer base? Are you hoping to pounce on their slow entry? Or are you calling them up and saying, hey guys, let's get into this? Like, what's going on behind the scenes? Sure, so a couple of things there. The first thing I would say is um, if, if Bitcoin goes to a trillion, or um, if Bitcoin goes to a million, then Anchorage is already custing trillions. <laughs> We're getting there. Uh, so we have, uh, we, have, uh, we have a lot of Bitcoin, and uh, we kind of looked at the market and like, looked at you know, who are the traditional custodians, how do they, how do they monetize, how do they like serve their clients, uh, and really looked at, you know, what are all the services that traditional custodians provide? Traditional custodians provide the ability to um, hold your assets, they provide the ability to lend out your assets, they provide the ability to um, vote in proxy voting, they provide the ability to collect coupon payments and dividend yield. All of those kinds of things are what, what traditional custodians do. And so, as much as possible, we want to quack like a duck. We want to look like that. Uh, we, won't, we won't be called BNY Mellon, but I do expect that the, um, the crypto custodians will look like the traditional custodians in many ways. Um, if this is an asset class that is going to matter, if this is an asset class that is going to grow over the next few decades, it is inevitable that the large players are gonna wanna get in. I'm 
really, really excited for the offering that Fidelity has come through, the offering that Bact has come through, uh, because that just kind of validates that this is a market that matters. Yeah. And as over time, I do expect that there will be partnerships between um, existing players and um, smaller players. You see in, in traditional equities a whole network of sub-custodians. So the, the large custodians are not themselves the ones that are actually holding all their assets. Yeah. There's a large network of sub-custodians that are holding, say, emerging market equities or other kinds of things like that. Yeah. And so I, I imagine that the bigger players will at some point look and say, hey, we need to uh, have some sort of sub-custodial model here uh, because the, the tech is so new and so different than what we do right now, but we still want to provide that to our clients. And so I, I do imagine that um, right now we may look like we're competitors up on the stage, but over time I imagine there will be quite pretty big partnerships. And, and this is another point to make, uh, Michael, is that, you know, imagine a world where Bitcoin's $500,000 a Bitcoin. And what the market cap of Bitcoin then is, and let's think about the market cap of the ecosystem overall, who's got a balance sheet that they're going to stack up against that for assets that can be lost? Like 100%, even the biggest, in the, and I don't want to speak for you guys, but that's where this changes, right? This is not, these, as we all know, everything in traditional finance is reversible, everything in crypto is irreversible. Yep. If you live in a, if, the, if this grand experiment works the way we expect, the repricing of these assets is so big and makes such a massive pool of capital that there aren't balance sheets in traditional custody or traditional Wall Street, et cetera, that any board is gonna say, yes, you can guarantee those assets and, and we 100%. So increasingly this becomes two things. It becomes an ecosystem of people that are really working together to figure out the, the, the best security solutions and in some ways, likely some form of team sport in which we're doing all of this together in some way. So I want to just, just, can I just want to, yeah, please, yeah. yeah. I want to draw a little historic parallel, right? So if you think about, if you think, of, and I, you can walk around here, there's a lot of people are in the equities markets in the last 25 or 30 years that are involved in crypto and because the, the way the market evolved, um, there's a lot of similarities. similarities. Um, but if you think about when we dematerialized the markets, when we went from, you know, pushing paper and coupons to electronification, um, there were a lot of startups. I worked for two of them. I worked for ITG and Liquidant that didn't exist. Right? And then you think about the incumbents back then, Morgan Stanley, uh, Goldman Sachs. What did they do? They pivoted into electronic markets. So, you know, there will be room for coopetition. Um, it's really going to come down to, you know, what your offering is. But I think what you're, you're probably going to see is, yes, you'll probably see if, if digital assets take place, yes, we will have to move more towards digital assets. But I also think there will be room for a lot of the incumbents because there's a lot of products and services that people don't even know about, right? Who, who thought about TCA and algorithms in the mid-90s, right? They were just nascent or even dark pools. So there's a lot of opportunity out there that will come as we move to a more digitized ecosystem. So to be a devil's advocate, though, uh, I, I think there's, there's two different... Um, uh, uh, values that we're talking about here. One is the asset itself and, and um, the potential value that it may or may not store. And another is the technology, um, which some people like to think is revolutionary and completely different and unique than what existed before it. So like, the, the idea that um, crypto service providers might someday look exactly like State Street and BNY Mellon kind of seems to be uh, anathemic to, to the idea that the technology itself is allowing different things to happen. Like, if, if uh, crypto custodians um, build themselves in the image of traditional custodians, um, have we kind of undermined the, 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 the tech value as in its uniqueness and really just boiled it down to a new asset? Or, or, or can we still have both where there's entirely new kinds of organizations um, providing services to crypto first investors. Yeah, I think it's it's a really interesting question because we we started a couple years ago and looked. You know, are we going to be, are we going to look like we're this really tech forward institution? Or are we going to try to kind of match what uh, traditional traditional finance looks like? And the fact is that if um, if pension funds want to come into this, if um, more traditional asset allocators, say endowments, folks like that want to come in, then they want the things to work with their organization in the same way that all their other asset, assets do. Uh, they don't want to have a wildly new set of tech processes. They don't want to have to abandon using fixed APIs and start using something else. They want everything to just kind of fit. And so our, our whole notion is we can look like a traditional institution, whereas on the back, we're a deeply technical firm that is dealing with all the complexity around crypto assets, 
uh, solving all of that, kind of summarizing it and, and presenting a user interface and a, an organizational interface that feels very familiar. And so we think that's kind of the, the winning move here is look and feel as much like a traditional custodian while having a, a deeply technical organization on the back. So, Dimitri, I just wanted to add uh, yeah, to, to that point because I spent the majority of my career in the buy side basically sitting as an well, last place I was partner in, in the place with three and a half billion assets under management. And we had Bank New York Mellon as sub-custodian. We were the custodian. And um, I've built the entire infrastructure basically there. And one thing I can say is that it would be absolutely impossible to plug new kind of things that we're building into that natively in such a manner that everything else is kind of streamlined because we'd have to use the same rails as we use to settle um, equities or to sell fixed income instruments and things like that. And that involves basically using um, portfolio management systems that are written in the 70s on the syntax called COBOL, using Swift Network, which jams basically every three hours because somebody missed a comma in MT500 message. And so I somewhat disagree to Nathan with regards to that. Like, look and feel is 100% important. With regards to technology, it will be much easier. Like me, a, a guy who basically was a CTO there, to integrate with, with a solution like we've built it will be so much better, so much easier, because you have a finally golden source of truth. Because in reality, the problem that we're solving from a technological standpoint is the database synchronization. Because essentially, currently, you have to have, it's an it's a error in the power of N. As many players, everybody needs to sync up with each other. We bring that into linear space because we have a golden source of truth. Mm -hmm. So from that standpoint, integration would become much, much easier. But you, to also follow up on the previous point, you know, and I, I agree to what Pete mentioned, I think like kind of like, it, it's super nice like, and exciting you know, when we get to like, a market where you know, BTC is a half a million and a, and a, and a million dollars. You know, but currently, the market cap of cryptocurrency is lower than Polish exchange, mm -hmm. right? And a custodian with one billion is 35,000 times smaller than any one of these guys, basically. And in comparison to take Facebook with two billion users, that would roughly make like 50,000 users, right? So. From our standpoint, what we're doing is um, we, we look at what obviously everyone else is doing, but we're staying super like ears to the ground, uh, listening to what the clients want, and um, essentially servicing that, that demand, um, which predominantly resonates around traditional fund setups. Uh, because when we talk about also institutional clients, who are we talking about? Yeah. We're talking about platforms, we're talking about asset managers, hedge funds, VCs, PE funds, who exactly we're talking about. And all of them have different demands for custody product. So uh, I hope I wasn't too obvious as the moderator that I got really excited when he said I disagree, um, which is what every moderator really wants, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to try and I'm going to pick at that oh, disagreement oh no. for a second here. <laughs> um, so we. Really, we've been talking very abstract about crypto assets. Can you just um, list off for me uh, very concretely what it is exactly that uh, Copper is custodying? Well, we, we custodied crypto assets, digital assets, right? Theoretically, we can use the same rails to custody. But are we talking Bitcoin? It's predominantly, predominantly what we are working with is we, we, we can custody over 100 different uh, assets, but predominantly what we work with is top five, top 10. And a larger portion of that are, is BTC. With this, the problem, I'll tell you one particular problem that we're solving, which, which has been like really pain in the, in the sector. A fund is launching a business, go to investors and says, give me the money, I'm going to manage it. Mm -hmm. Say, can you steal it? He says, well, I use custodian. I say, okay, well, when you move it to exchange, can you steal it? Like, well, theoretically, but I'm a good guy, right? So that basically doesn't work. Yeah. That doesn't fly with any institution whatsoever. That's why we're seeing like tickets as high as like maybe in, in, in America, but like European guys. I mean, this is different investor perspective altogether. You know, so uh, they're saying, well, look, I don't care. Like here's zero or 500k ticket. Go have fun. You know. So the solution and, and, and the exchanges are built today in such a manner, whereas you have to have inventory there basically to trade. You you mentioned equities though as as a possible thing that you Down might, the line, of course. I mean, down, down the line. line. But the thing is, so what, the question, though, if I, if I could interrupt, sorry, I just want to make sure that we uh, keep the trajectory focused to here on the, the panelists. Um, so the, the, the trajectory where you are custodying uh, non-cryptocurrency assets, yep. um, uh, equities issued on a blockchain, um, real estate issued on a blockchain, um, where perhaps all uh, digitized assets are I issued on a blockchain. Um, in, in that environment, um, do you see yourselves, I mean, if, if, if we're really honest, are you competing with the State Streets and the BNY Mellons of the world, or? Uh, Down the line, yeah. yeah. I think it's more of a 
blue ocean strategy, right? Yeah. So equities and fixed income, they kind of sort of work. Like, but we have a lot of asset classes which are so rusty. We were just talking about before the panel. Settlement time, T plus five, T plus 25. And somewhere in this, in this journey, you have to cross your fingers and say 50 million to someone you, you've never met, yeah. right? This is suboptimal solution. Yeah. So obviously, settlements and clearings, basically, because we, we, we basically provide custody, prime brokerage, and settlements and clearing services. Settlements and clearing is going to be migrating to blockchain. Hands down, I've seen it from the other side. It's impossible to work. And 40% of our workforce was doing like operations, and these people cost a lot of money, <laughs> right? Like, because like on the last panel, somebody dismissed, like, who cares? Banks spend money. Like, banks don't spend money, we pay for it. Yeah. Basically, so there's a lot of like big operational issue there, which can be solved uh, with blockchain. But I don't think we're going to start with equities or fixed income instruments. There are some much larger problems. But as I said, it's, it's coming back to your point, it's somewhat of a blue ocean strategy. You go to the buy side and you tell them where is the problem, basically. How can I solve this problem for you? Yeah. And then uh, you go up the ladder and go for more and more efficient instruments. And the and I think the challenge in any large organization, such as you know, and I mean, it's just my assumption, right, is to tell the board, like, we're missing a boat, we need to do this, like, come on, let's, let's get moving, right? For, but currently, as I mentioned, 35,000 difference, right, times. So as soon as it kind of starts chipping into that, I think there will be some sort of, as Nathan mentioned, partnerships and collaborations and things like that using technology. So we'll we, we talked, to, I, I had a chance to ask all three um, leaders within the startup community about your analysis of the, the, the legacy institutional world and how you position yourself, what you're studying, that sort of a thing. I want to kind of ask the same question um, to, to Pete and Jay. Um, I'm sorry, Frank and Jay. <laughs> uh, you're sitting on the sideline here, but very involved. There's definitely some services being provided, um, though not custodian services. Uh, and, and, and studying, I'm imagining. Uh, when, when you look at the, 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 general, the, the companies represented by the gentleman to your right here, um, what are you learning from them? What, what's going on in the boardrooms at your companies, and what are you waiting for or looking for? You want, you want me to start? Yeah. Sure. Um, so first, a couple things. Uh, we, too, spend a lot of time on the digital asset side, right? So it's, we're, we're obviously talking about currencies today, but but similarly in the credit markets and the equity markets, spending a lot of time and, and testing a variety of distributed ledger technologies. And, um, and again, because of the dematerialization, this is very important to this audience. I mean, it's already ones and zeros, right? It's not that the, there's somebody downstairs, right, counting stocks. I mean, it's already digitally moving. Mm -hmm. um, this is a very important point for, for the market that I don't think gets enough time. We haven't talked about it too much. I, I don't believe this is a technology problem. Like people talk about better technology. The, the technology is not the issue here. Let me ask you a couple of quick questions uh, in the election season. How many of you think that the G SIPI banks, the two of us, but JP Morgan and B of A, how many of you think they should be less regulated? Okay, a handful, right? But a very, very small minority, right? Think that, that the big banks should have less regulation around them. Let's, let's talk about what's on the table. This is your money. This is your future, your, your house, your, your retirement, when we talk about custody and the safety and sanctity of that money. And so, you know, people ask me all the time about the SEC and what are they going to allow. I said the SEC is there for the protection of the investor, right? They're not out to, to, to harm you. They're, they're out to help you, right? So when a company like WeWork tries to go public and there's a lot of private money in there, all of a sudden they have to open up their books and there's a lot more due diligence. Again, for a company to go public, there's a lot of disclosures. Anything that happens, they have to file immediately on the Edgar site, right? Again, to protect the investor. And so when you ask yourself, like, what, is, what does that mean, custody, and the regulation that we live behind, right? So when you want to go open a bank account, it's not like onboarding at Facebook, right? Filling out a quick form and you're onboarded. Uh, when, you want to, when you want to be onboarded at a bank, there is a lot of due diligence that goes on behind the scene. Credit checks and checks of who you are, right, in terms of what's called anti-money laundering and know your client. Um, when, when we think about our technology infrastructure of what that means and what the Fed looks at us to have resiliency and backup disaster recoveries, minimum 80 miles apart, and what that looks like, like, the technology world doesn't, doesn't operate under those rules. So I did, we're, we're running out of time. I want to interrupt. I'll take a little bit of exception yeah, please. to that. I got, I'm sorry, um, respectfully. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. We, um, we put a ton of energy into, into AML KYC. Why? Because we're personally liable. 
The people that sign the contracts are personally liable. Uh, unlike a big bank, I spent 20 years in traditional finance. I know the difference. We, take, we put a ton of time and energy into that. Um, second, we're, we want regulation. We want to be regulated. I'll say it out loud. We want the clarity of regulation. Shh, please, please, SEC or CFTC or whoever is the appropriate regulator in the US, lead this. Don't allow some other jurisdiction somewhere else in the world to lead this. Yeah. So, That's our perspective. Yeah. I, Go I ahead. I, I would, we are done. I want to give everybody um, a chance to g g yeah. give me a 15 second response here, Nathan. I've, uh, I've met with the SEC dozens of times over the past two years. They're starting to joke about whether or not I have an, an apartment in DC. Uh, and it is extraordinarily clear to me that every time I leave there, number one, I feel more patriotic because they are so on top of this over at the SEC. Uh, and they understand this is a technology problem. They understand in, inherently that uh, being able to safely safeguard digital assets is fundamentally a technology problem, and they are, they are looking at this from a technology perspective. And there are actually, I think in many ways, technological innovations that are gonna be necessary even from right now, uh, in order to have this be a, a regulated industry. Dimitri, 15 second closing thoughts. Well, we're London-based. Um, from, the, from the regulatory environment standpoint, I think it's doing a um, better job than, um, than in the US, um, because you, you can have a conversation with them. There is no, there is like, they, they're keen to learn, they're keen to find out. And, but I absolutely agree with everything that uh, you guys mentioned before me. You know, we'd like to be regulated, we'd like to be rules in place, and we'd like to give the same level of protection that banks do uh, to our customers. Jay, closing thoughts? Single asset is not gonna change this market, it's not gonna move this market. The quality of digital assets right now is not gonna change and move this market. When issuers start to issue quality digital assets, you'll start to see the needle moving. I also I just want to close with the elephant in the room. Uh, how many of you consider yourself uh, crypto initiated? You already know what the heck is going on. How many of you consider yourself new? Okay, that's actually not as bad an elephant as we thought. Uh, on that note, I'll go ahead and close. Please give our uh, panelists a round of applause.